everyone, and thanks for so many of you turning out to this. This is great. Um, I guess just uh, before I really go in, like I, I think most of you are aware that today is the National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. That's the orange shirt. Um, so I, I am going to start this with just a land acknowledgement, and I'll just talk a little bit about what this means. Um, so just to start with the land acknowledgement, we acknowledge the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabek, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Um, I guess just a quick plug that uh, it's an important day for our country, and I, I really encourage all of you to uh, try to spend some time today just to, to think about it, to learn about it. There's so many good resources out there. You know, take a look at the at the calls for action of the Truth and Reconciliation com uh, Committee of 94 Calls for Action. One of them was the creation of this um, day as a, as a federal holiday. And also for those who are interested in maps and data like I am, this is great site that's called Whose Land that actually maps out all of the historical treaties. So, you know, you hear this talk of we are in, we are um, covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Like, what does that mean? Well, Treaty 13 is right here. It's called the Toronto Purchase. And uh, it's just a great resource for sort of explaining some of the history of these treaties. So, just start with that. And, um, I guess there was a quick introduction there. This is this is me. Um, I've been, uh, you know, a long time student here and kept a relationship going with this university for a long time. Um, so as mentioned, I was uh, did my bachelor's in engineering science here in the infrastructure option, uh, and then did a master's under Eric's tutelage, uh, and worked as a transportation planner for about ten years with IBI Group, now Arcadis or something like that. Um, and then I went to the city in 2015, where I started by, by sort of starting up a data science and analytics team called the Big Data Innovation Team, and then I've sort of moved into a managerial role overseeing a larger transportation data practice. Um, and over that time, too, I come back here and I, I'm an instructor also, so I teach the fourth year civil engineers uh, capstone project as well. In the, there's a Vision Zero and data and transportation focus project that I've been doing for several years. So that's about me. Um, so I guess what's the, the main gist of this talk today is I'm, gonna, I'm just going to talk a little bit about my, my team, but I also kind of want to uncover a little bit, like, what is what does a data team mean? Like, I, th I think there's a lot of, like, we, we have this within the city, we have it externally, that there is, like, any, any of you are like office space fans. Um, like, it's really hard to actually understand what, what a data team does and what it means. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about the types of roles that exist in within a data team, um, sort of how we perceive of it, how we're sort of growing a data practice. Um, you know, if you're if you're someone like say um, say all of you guys, none of you work for the city of Toronto, you know, you have certain like snapshots into what you know, what data is coming out of the city of Toronto. You know, there's different things, like you can go to the open data portal, you can see a few snapshots, you know, this is our charting movement counts or our open data. You'll see these like random reports pop up. This is the, the report I'll talk about a bit later about the active TO, Midtown, bike lanes and complete street project. Um, some data on that is like, oh, there's a vision zero dashboard. Oh, we write the odd report. Sometimes we're in the news. You know, we get turning movement counts, other data from us. I need to turn the time around for these slides. Anyway. Um, and, you know, even the cording counts, you all, you all use the cording counts here that are hosted through DMG. You know, our, our team collects that data for, um, to feed into the, to feed into the region. But it's, it's kind of like, you know, you just see that from the outside. Like, what's actually happening inside a data team? Um, so, like, if you think about what the different roles are that exist within a data team, the sort of like classic definitions of a modern data team, you know, if you go Google this, you know, it'd be like what what's a data what what are the roles of a data team? You know, you'll see you'll often see these classic three data engineers, data analysts, data scientists. Um, and you know, we definitely sort of have that role definition within our team, though not 
it's more about like a functional definition. These are jobs that happen. It's not always necessary. Just like one person is the data analyst, and another person is the data engineer. You know, you sort of work across these domains. Uh, but data engineering, if you haven't heard the term, you know, it's about building and creating infrastructure for. Let's see if I can do this stuff. Just give me one second. So data, you know, data engineers are about building and creating the infrastructure to manage data. You know, the databases, the pipelines, uh, the tools. They create transformations of data, build data products. Um, you know, what that's essentially about is like, you know, if you're a data analyst or a data scientist, you need data to do that work. And you, you know, you all as students have this challenge all the time, where you um, you have to dive into random data sets all the time, often messy. Um, hard to mix with other data sets. So data engineers are the ones who are there to organize it, um, try to get it structured in a way that like every time an analyst or data scientist wants to go into that work, it's sort of ready for them to go. It's not like you know weeks and weeks and weeks of crunching and then playing with that data just to get it to the state where it's ready to be used. Um, the, the distinction, you know, data analysts and data scientists, I, they're very much one and the same a lot of times, but like I would say that the traditional definition of it in some ways is like a data analyst is someone that's focused more on like descriptive analysis. So someone who's like taking their data sets, trying to understand what they're saying, um, establish trends out of it, tell stories out of it, you know, communicate what's in that analysis. And I think to me the leap to data science is when you're really starting to like think more predictively, uh, a lot more sort of statistics and machine learning and, and taking that sort of like next step to focus on predictive analytics. And I think in the industry too, there's a lot of, you know, data scientists spend a lot of time trying to like, like productionize models and productionize um, predictive tools. And what that means is like building those algorithms into pieces of software, or building those algorithms in, into the sort of tools that are, people are using. Um, so those are the classic ones, and we have those. Um, but you'll see that within our team too, we're a bit more multidisciplinary. And I think it's better that way, but you, there's so much around the upside too. So the other stuff that we have going on in our team, we, have, we actually do some software development. So we have a team of product, a product manager, web developers, uh, UX research and design, some people who are working with users of data to sort of identify what they need, sort of iteratively build with them, make sure that they're getting what they want out of these products. Um, we don't really have these, but we're sort of moving to this, like, um, data architects, I, uh, a lot of different things of calling, ways of calling that, but like this is all about like developing the strategy around data needs, setting standards for data governance, metadata. When you get into an organization like the city, I'm sure it's the same here, but when you get into an organization like the city, there is just so many pockets of teams and people and tools and systems where everyone is sort of stepping on their each other's toes. No one knows what the source of truth is for anything. Um, and this is sort of part of what we're trying to muddle our way through a little bit. Just, to be honest, just starting out in this problem. And then you, like, you just need project managers and engineers to things like we run a data collection program, you need people who can, um, to, who can sort of manage the operational elements of the programs like that. Um, within, within the data team, there's also this sort of like integration of skill sets. And I'd say this sort of falls within the realm of engineering is sort of another way of looking at the, that realm of data engineering, data analysis, data science, um, where like when we're looking for people in our team, for example, like we know that you're not, you're not going to find one person who does all this stuff. This is, why you, this is why you build a team, right? So, you know, there's statistics and hard data analysis and machine learning and all that sort of classic data science skills. There's software development, coding, there's design and visualization. There's database, like database skills, data management knowledge, uh, data warehousing, all that stuff. Transportation is just in some ways one of the elements within that, you know, um, and cartography and JS. So you'll find, you know, on a team like ours, some people have transportation backgrounds and some people don't. Um, and I think that's good and fine. And, you know, the, the people who have this sort of classic transportation engineering or planning training can, you know, bring that knowledge to projects, but it doesn't have to be everything. 
Um, so I guess that transitions just to me talking a little bit about how we organize ourselves. So I sort of talk about the different types of roles that we have uh, within within the data analytics unit at the city. I feel like we need a better word than unit, but anyway, it's the city where uh, the data analytics unit. Uh, we have sort of four different squad. Squad, sure, we'll go with squad. We have teams within that, so like the teams fit within a squad, maybe, <laughs> possibly. Uh, so we have data collection, data science, data operations, and well, the product is called Move, so we call it the Move team, but it's a digital product team. And um, I'll, I'll sort of go through these a little bit more in the subsequent slides, but like essentially what it comes down to is like, you know, we have a wing that's data collection, right? So like any of the traffic counts in the city come through our team, and there is a lot of them. It's a huge program. We'll talk more about it. Uh, we also manage all of the permanent permanent data collection, so like permanent counters and that type of infrastructure, make decisions on where they should go. And there aren't many of them now, but there will be more. And manage crash data as well, which comes to us from the police. Then we sort of have these um, data science and data operations team. These sort of middle two teams really grew out of what was formerly the big data innovation team when it, when it first started. And they sort of got morphed into this uh, role. And as they've grown, the sort of need to separate them out has become a bit stronger, though they still work very closely together. Um, so, uh, I don't know, a friend of the program here, Rafael Dumas, the leader of that data operations emerging mobility team, and he's coming to speak here in a few weeks as well, too, I believe. Um, but th this is sort of our data science safety mobility. So, we really focus on questions around, like, a lot of it is monitoring the sort of what happens with our different programs in the city as we transform streets. So, you know, the classic example, the hot button item is always bike lane projects, but you know, there's transit projects as a whole slew of them. And thinking about ways to do that uh, more efficiently, smarter, more holistically. Uh, we do a lot of sort of predictive analytics work around the Vision Zero program. So what you know, what are the most dangerous streets in the city? How do you how do you sort of prioritize where you're making investments in road safety? And then this one is shown right down here for this this team, but it kind of um, crosses everything in a way. Um, I think I'll just move on to the next slide. I'm going to dive into this a little bit more. Um, just, but just before we go through this, like I think one of the, just to set the context of what we've been going through, like I sort of talked at the beginning how I came to the city, started this team called the Big Data Innovation Teams. We sort of been growing up over the years. Like, really the journey so far is like we started back then with like very strategically answering a few questions on data. We weren't really responsible for anything. It was a small team of a couple people who knew how to like analyze and play with data. You know, through that, you know, first couple of years of that, like we were able to sort of prove the value of the data and prove the value of analytics. And all of a sudden, like everyone wants it. Every every project in the city is like, oh, can you come in and help us with you know collecting data and monitoring and, and delivering dashboards around it. Um, and then and then there's also like once you've built a couple of things, you know, you're always getting asked to do it over again. You know, like, oh, can you refresh that dashboard you built, or can you can you redo that analysis with some new data? Um, and people start to hear about some of the new data sets we have. Oh, can we request that data from you guys? Can you know, can can it be provided for university projects, right? Um, so then what happens is like, it's great. You know, we're excited that everybody wants this, but our team is still the same couple of people. And we don't really have any ability to handle the, the sort of load that's come towards us. So then in some way, you sort of hit this like, we're overwhelmed and victims of our own success stage. And then, you know, there's like a next stage, which is like, okay, well, we need to come up with a vision of what a data analytics team should be, or what it should look like. You know, that's sort of what this is in some ways, you know, come up with a vision like this. And you have to work through the bureaucracy to come up with all of the, make the case for it, get the budgets approved, get the staff approved, all of that. And then, and then from there, once that's approved, you can build and grow and sustain again. So we're we're sort of like in the middle of, we're like in this stage of it now, to be honest. Like we're we've we've made the case for growth. We've been approved a whole bunch of new staff over the years to sort of grow the grow the practice up. Um, and then. Um, well, you'll see a plug at the end too, like we're going to be hiring and uh, continuing to grow this thing. So that's sort of like the, the bigger picture of the journey that we're on. Um, I think it's like, like 
as we as we work through this, like you don't really realize how much you're going to get bogged down with stuff like requests for data, the little the little stuff. Like you sort of hit a point in the middle where you're like, we don't actually have any time to do any any new work right now. Like we're just sort of keeping the lights on. Um, so I guess when we think about just what the overall goals of our program are, we talk about like there is again there's so many demands on on a data team on you know the, the sort of pocket of in-house folks who can play with data that like we need to really focus what we work on on the most meaningful and high impact projects and so that comes through sort of smart prioritization of what we work on uh, which is hard you know sometimes we succeed sometimes we don't um, there's also an element that's sort of buried in here which is like I don't actually don't know where it fits within this but like it's sort of like finishing what you start it's like when you have a lot of sort of loose ends that aren't tied up all over the place, it's another thing that sort of drags you down. Um, so like, um, it's just an important focus of it too. But part of, another thing that we're focused on through our data collection practice is transforming how we sort of collect, store, and share data so that, you know, things like getting more and more of our data onto open data and doing that in a way that's automated so we don't have to touch it. Um, you know, just to, you know, make everyone happy. Right? Academics happy they can just get the data straight from the source. We're happy we don't have to process data requests. Um, and we're happy also because we feel like it should all be open and shared. Like there's, there's no reason for any of it to be hidden within our systems. Um, the number three focus on talent and capacity. Like, we've been very intentional from the beginning that this is an in-house data practice. Um, I can probably count on like one hand couple fingers the number of times that we've actually hired consultants to work with us over, I've been at the city for seven years, um, we've maybe used to consult it once or twice, but not even really in core analytics projects and some of the other stuff. Um, so our mission is really about like building up teams who can work with data, play with data, analyze it, um, and do it all ourselves. It's just, it's so much more uh, efficient when you have the capacity yourself, like the the hurdle to like educate people in say the consulting workforce about the data sets you have or to put out procurements, all of that is just it's so much time and energy. And uh, you know, you just need that sort of that sort of know how in house to be able to answer questions as they come up. You can't have to be waiting for um, you know, waiting for the consultants to come or whatever. Um, I think the other piece of that too is that, you know, there's a lot of you know, when I first when I first came to the city, you know, the team name was Big Data Innovation Team. You know, the word big data shows up in the name there. It's like every tech vendor under the under the sun is like calling you, like, oh, will you buy this platform? Can I can I pitch you on whatever? And like all of that stuff doesn't really matter. You know, there's there's so much sort of buzz around what the you know fancy technology system or platform is, and like. All you have to do is like get a few free open source tools together and some smart people to put them on the problem. Like it, it, it doesn't doesn't really need to be that complicated. Um, there's growing pains that come with that, but like um, that's just another element of like focusing on the people and less about the platforms and the technology and all that. Um, you know, bringing this data science mindset though and giving space to smart people to experiment with data is really important to us. Um, building modern digital products. So building ways people can access data that makes them happy and is pleasurable to them and makes them excited to come to work. And then the last element is that we consider ourselves to be sort of value driven in the work that we do. You know, we feel strongly about issues of sustainability, climate change, you know, um, sort of undoing a lot of past harms that have come from the transportation sphere, whether it's through equity type analyses, whether it's, you know, questions of reconciliation, um, and I don't, you know, whether while we work in government, I don't, I don't think there's any problem in, in having a strong value system of what we're trying to bring to the job. Uh, so I'm just going to talk a little bit about, about what each of these teams focuses on, and then I'll go into some case studies after that. Um, I sort of talked about this a bit, so I won't, I won't go too much more on this, but so the data science team. Like really what that is about is like a, this sort of tactical focus on answering questions and driving policy. Um, and really what we want to strive to, and this is something we can always get help with, you know, people in the academic sphere is finding good and smart ways of doing this, but it's like, 
how do you bring a holistic picture of the impacts of transportation projects and policies? Um, and when I say holistic, I mean uh, multimodal impacts is always important. Safety, accessibility, climate, equity. Um, you know, an example of the work that we do, well, I guess it's like the last point there is what I think is most important. It's like this moving beyond what is easy to be measured to what should be measured and what needs to be presented. You know, we, we're very good, for example, right now. We have data from, you know, here technologies, which I think you all might have access to as well here to some degree. But, you know, we have you know, five minute level speed data of how fast traffic is moving on streets. So you want to ask us a question about traffic congestion in the city? Sure, we can, we can crunch data and you'd be like, yeah, the travel times on Queen Street have gone up one, you know, one minute in the month of June. You know, we can tell you that. We can do it really quickly, really efficiently. Is that all that matters though? Like, is that actually the question that we're supposed, that we should be measuring and presenting to our de decision makers? It's one piece of the, it's one piece of the question, but, you know, when it comes to answering some of these other questions, what's the equity impact of that project? You know, what's the impact of that project on, you know, the city's climate goals, Transform TO? You know, what, what's the impact on road safety? Those are a lot harder to answer, but no less, no less important. So, this part of the vision of a data science team is being able to build up the tools and processes so that we can do that on demand when we need to. Uh, so that's data science, data operations. You know, it's kind of the beside, behind the scenes stuff that really allows everything else to function. Um, sometimes referred to as data engineering. Like we just, we can't do anything if the data isn't managed, organized. You know, so we build databases, we use cloud cloud systems for this, we you know automate flows and pipelines of data into these systems. Um, you know, there's room for stuff like machine learning in this in this work as well too, of just like automated validation checks, um, like gap filling, uh, you know, sort of time series approaches to, to fixing data sets as they come in. Um, but it's just it's such key bedrock work that like until you've done this across a lot of your key data sets, which we haven't got there yet, to be honest. We've, we've done some, but not all. Um, it's really hard to do some of the data science and analysis. Um, data collection. Uh, so we have one of the largest data traffic data collection programs in North America and possibly the world, uh, which is kind of both a good thing and a bad thing in some ways. Um, you know, we do a lot of sort of like request-based traffic counts. So like every time someone in the city, you know, calls 311 or calls their city councilor to be like, you know, I think there should be a stop sign in this corner or can we change the speed limit? Like every one of those little requests like triggers this need to collect data. And usually it's like, you know, eight hour or whatever, one day turning movement count at an intersection, like two counts, ATR counts for measuring speed and volume. So we do a lot of that. Um, I think we could do less of it, to be honest. Like, I think a lot of it could be handled more efficiently through more proactive means, I guess I'll say. But anyway, this is the program we do, and, and so we have staff that have to deal with, you know, the people who are requesting that data, oversee the quality of it, deal with our contractors who go out and actually put the cameras up or put the equipment on the streets, deliver the counts to them. The, the software that I talk about, the Move, Move product, is something that we use to sort of help this out. Um, but also, like, you know, the part of reducing how much do we do it, you know, can we do like more in permanent data collection, permanent counters, can we use data algorithms um, instead to be, have a close enough estimate of what, what some of these counts are. Um, and then, but it really comes down to just sort of like overseeing and managing some of these really key bedrock transportation data sets. Um, also, like, how meaningful is a one day turning movement count? I, you know, I don't think it's particularly meaningful. This, you know, if you do, a, you do it over a couple days, like there's so much day-to-day -day variation that like, you know, we have this sort of notion in our field of like, this is an accurate piece of data because it was collected and you have it in nice 15 minute bins and like, okay, let's, let's use this for analysis. And people are kind of like blinders on looking at this turning movement count, but I don't know. I just don't, I don't think it's that meaningful. There's so, you know, what was the weather that day? What was it like the next day? You know, it's, it's more meaningful if it's, collected over longer periods of time, and I think a model representation of that could be just as useful. Um, this is our data collection program. Um, this is a few years old now, but like in 2019, we did almost 1,800 
speed volume ETR counts over like two counts. We did about 800 training movement counts. We do these pedestrian delay studies. Like there's just, there's thousands of studies that are going on every year. And this, it, we've only gone up since then. Um, our permanent counting infrastructure is still in a pretty uh, pathetic state, I would say. Um, but we've been doing a lot of the sort of like behind the scenes work to come up with ways of making that sort of sustainable and then keep it going. Like one of the things that's happened in the past is put in a counter, but if you don't have the right um, processes set up to be able to fix it when it's broken, then they all just break and fall in disrepair, and then it's it's a big challenge. So I can have plan on that more at another time. Um, I'm just going to skip through this. I think I touched this. Um, so this was this is Move, the data platform that I talked about. Um, where now our, our staff internally, and one day we we're hoping to be able to make this public as well, can go in and like collect collision data at any intersection or street in the city. They can see sort of all the historical traffic counts that were there. Um, they can also go in and request new counts. So if they need a new count to be done, it'll request it through the software and it'll come into our team to collect it. Um, and it's just sort of really made this job a lot easier and more pleasurable and enjoyable for our staff and efficient. And we've sort of brought this team in house so we can now like, you know, set the direction of it, and iterate it, and, and continue to develop it as we need to. Um, just talking a little bit about what some of the data sources we use day to day are. This is a snapshot of it. So I mentioned here, here technologies or here data, we get that data from Transport Canada. And it, again, it's a bedrock data set that we use for so many analyses. And it's great. Um, we have a pretty good feel for the like strengths and limitations of it as well. So know sort of how to apply it, when to. Um, we're also working on an open data release data, um, hopefully in the next one-ish months, um, that will be sort of like block level speed data, um, sort of aggregated by hour and month, that hopefully will have a more this, it takes a lot of work to sort of analyze and transform and, and crunch that data. So we're trying to get into a place that's a little bit easier for people to use. Um, so that's coming up. Uh, we have these, you know, Bluetooth and Wi-Fi wi detectors, which I'd say our reliance on has gone down on going down. Sorry, our reliance on them has gone down over the years, mostly because the issues of maintenance that I talked about. Like, whenever you're putting like sensors on the street, they break. If you don't have a good way of fixing them, which we didn't, um, it's just really hard to keep a network of them going. And then if you don't have a good network or grid of, of sensors, then the, the data is not as useful. So it's still, you know, still kind of working. But traffic counts I've talked about. Um, our team has done a lot of work in the in the what we what we, we talk about as vehicle for hire, uh, but we're have sort of recently taken over the sort of management of all of the ride hailing data in the city. Um, so the city requires all, you know, Uber, Lyft, all the right hailing providers to provide trip level data, data about um, what we call period one or sort of like empty, empty travel on the streets. Um, collision data, there's a whole bunch of different data sets that we're getting through them. So we're right now in the process of building up our sort of software systems and our database systems to be able to do that data engineering work so that we can have it ready for analysis. So it's ongoing work. and. You know, we have rescue data, which I think at some point was piping in here. I don't know if it still does. Um, it's also very broken a lot, and we struggle to use it. But uh, collision and safety data is really important to us. Then there's the sort of like, you know, weather data, incident data. Incident data is also really hard. And, you know, at times we, we get access to transit data. And there's, there's more, you know, we have, like, it, one of the data sets we've used over the course of the pandemic is, uh, you know, the watch your speed signs in the neighborhoods that show like you're driving whatever, 40 kilometers an hour, it's a 30 zone. Um, we, we actually pull data from those systems as well. It's on open data as well. Um, it's not the most reliable, but I think if you use it smartly over over on a sort of citywide or area basis, it, it's pretty good at telling you trends about what's happening. Um, so enough about, that's, I guess that's the like, the context of the type of work we do. I'm just going to highlight a few case studies and then try to leave space for a few questions. We always 
go through this for maybe about 10 more minutes. Um, so I guess first case study, um, you know, we've been going through a global pandemic that's had a lot of impact on transportation. So our, our team has had a big role in sort of answering questions about what, you know, what's the status of traffic on streets in the city. Um, there's a lot of sort of decisions that um, were triggered based off of the, the data that we were presenting to sort of our division. You know, it's like, can we extend the amount of time that construction vehicles can be occupying the street if there's no traffic in the streets? Decisions like that. Can we be repurposing road space for active uses? Um, so this is just a plot that shows, you know, from you know, the, the shutdown in 2020 all the way to, I guess, July of this year. Uh, this is the travel type index of um, uh, speeds across the whole city of Toronto, sort of aggregated up across all the, the streets in the city. I think excluding 400 series highways, if I remember correctly. Um, I think one of the funniest parts of this plot is just like the word salad of all the periods that are were named by our provincial government, like just reading through state of emergency, stage one restart, stage two restart, stage three restart, modified stage two, red zone, gray zone, Ontario shutdown, gray zone in, stay at home, reopening step one, step two, step three, modified step two, phase two, reopening, like, it's just it's hilarious. But, where, where, where's Omicron? <laughs> where's Omicron? Yeah. Uh, here. Uh, makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that's also known as re modified restart step seventeen point six. Pretty much, yeah. Um, so we've been monitoring this sort of citywide. We've also been monitoring traffic volumes through some of our permanent uh, collection devices, uh, mostly in the downtown though. So traffic and bikes and pedestrians. Um, so that's one one case study. Second one is the transportation impacts of vehicle for hire, which is sort of. We, we did a first report on this and worked really closely together with a bunch of people from this, this room here uh, back in 2019, I think, 18. Um, and then we did a refresh of that study just last year. And um, so that we've just been doing a lot of ongoing work. This was, you know, I think, a plot from the original study that was just sort of showing where the uh, pickups were in the downtown area. Um, but we have some, I think, pretty great reports about this on our website, and I look forward to continuing the collaboration on this work with uh, universities as well. Uh, this is just an, this is an output of some predictive modeling work that we've been doing around Vision Zero. Um, so essentially, the the task that we had was we were looking at mid block uh, mid block collisions in the city of Toronto. So not not collisions that happen at intersections, um, and I think that. You know, one of the one of the core challenges with Vision Zero in Toronto is this the sort of road safety situation, especially outside of the core. Once you get into more suburban parts of town, and you know the sort of classic example, um, and you see it in the data, is like you know you have these giant blocks of you know suburban arterial streets, very fast moving traffic. Um, People sometimes need to cross the street and aren't, aren't like always able or willing to like walk hundreds of meters to the nearest light to cross. You know, sometimes there's a transit stop on one side of the street. They need to cross to a, their home or a grocery store, um, and it's just you know when you in, in in the role I have now, you know, we we're getting you know every few days we're getting the notice of every traffic fatality in the city, and like you just you just see you can dive through the data and see these patterns but you can also just see it you know it, it's seniors it's like um and it's just this like this pattern is just such a it's a wicked problem to solve because it is so much about just like built environment and uh speed of traffic and the you know the way we've designed our cities or our city um but one of the things we're trying to do is like can we find more systematic ways of identifying what the most dangerous spots are and can we throw a lot of variables at the project at that problem and use it for decision making? You know, like if we're gonna if we have X number of dollars to spend on a problem of how to fix these streets, whether it's like inserting mid-block traffic signals, whether it's you know different um, uh, different treatments to try to slow down traffic. There's, there's, there's different things that are available, but you know, where should we be spending our our, our money? Um, that's sort of how we build tools to help our business zero team with those questions. 
Uh, it's really it's really tricky, right? Like when you when you dive into data like this, there's nothing that it's really hard to find what is like fundamentally different from like Eglinton and Lawrence and Scarborough. Like they're kind of they're similar, you know, the, the build form is similar. Um, but I think there is things that are different from say like you know arterials in Scarborough versus an arterial in Etobicoke, just around the like a man of street activity, commercial activity, and, and so on that's there. So uh, so we want to extend this work to intersections as well in the near future. Uh, King Street Pilot, this was a few years ago now, but we, this was kind of one of our first like big projects as a team where we were doing the monitoring of uh, you know, what were the impacts of that King Street Pilot on, on vehicle travel times, on transit times and reliability, on pedestrians, on cyclists. Um, so we deployed a bunch of these camera-based camera technology from a company called MyoVision sort of a grid through downtown Toronto to monitor pedestrians, bikes, vehicles. We also use Bluetooth detectors a lot and, you know, data from the TTC. And it was kind of the first, you know, the first time where we were able to present this information and, like, really have a data-driven narrative of what was happening from a project and show, like, you know, it, what did it show? It showed that the impact on traffic was essentially null. Like, it, it, it was fine. And then the benefits of transit were overwhelming. And I think if you don't do this stuff, though, um, you know, the sort of anecdotal conversation takes over. You know, it's it's one one of the powers that you have in like being able to have this road congestion data. It's like actually, you know, everyone is freaking out in a neighborhood about a certain project, but like, and you know, I think I think that a lot of times those concerns are real. They like, you know, there are some bad days, but. You can also be like, okay, but over overall, there's some benefits of this project, and you know the impact on travel times on the street was a minute. Like well, what I do find by monitoring pedestrians, uh, because I do autonomous driving, and I find like pedestrians is the most unpredictable creature in the world. Uh, they're very unpredictable. I think I think that like, but do we need to predict them? I don't know. Like I think we just need to. Give space and not run them over. Like, <laughs> I, th I think that like, the, I think one of the most important parts of this project was like showing also that if you if you look at a, a plot of the the volumes of different road users on streets like King Street in downtown Toronto, right? Like historically, traffic engineers, what, what do we do? Go in there. We go and track count the cars, right? If you actually go in there and count the pedestrians, count the bikes, you know, you're like cars and pedestrians, yeah. right? Like, there's just like, I just think that that needs to go into the like the decision making of how you're designing these streets and what you're prioritizing. So it's just sort of bringing that that view forward. But yeah, I think I don't know. Yeah, we're all pedestrians, and uh, you know, back to the Vision Zero thing. It's you know, Vision Zero is mostly about slowing down traffic and and um, protecting vulnerable road users. Uh, this is one that's ongoing right now, which is. The uh, Midtown Complete Street, Young Street. Uh, so Young Street from Bloor up to Davisville has been. Uh, the curb lanes were, were rebuilt as bike lanes and street cafes, essentially. Um, and it's sort of the, the hot project of the day. So we've put together some monitoring of what the impacts on travel time have been of that project. So impacts on travel time, and then like how many bikes and people uh, walking there are. Um, and sort of what we found here is like. Uh, Bike lanes went in here, so this is the young travel times, and essentially they went up. This is really fuzzy; it's hard to see, but essentially travel times were actually worse in the midday. Went up by about one, one and a half minutes um, at the worst times so on Young Street from Florida Davisville, and then the number of people cycling, you know, went from you know 600 people up to about 1,800, 1,700, depending on where you look at it. So. 180 percent increases in cycling. But this is this is sort of one of these examples too of like when I was talking about the role of data science. Like we're very good at doing this, like these two perspectives of a project. But like, does this encompass what the impact of a project like that is? Like, is this all that matters? Those couple of variables. I think it would be amazing to be able to actually quantify more easily, like what the road safety benefits of a project like that are. Um, what the climate benefits of it are, et cetera. Um, so I guess just some quick concluding thoughts and I'll give a plug for upcoming jobs too. Um, 
I think like we're just starting in some ways. Like we're we're building up the team. A lot of this stuff about like really being organized and like having all the the data that we care about at our fingertips. Like we still have a ways to go there. Um, but it's fun. Like it's fun work. It's um, you know the, doing it in government adds this like element of challenge of bureaucracy, HR, all, all this kind of stuff. Like how do you get the best people into these teams? Um, but at the same time, the like the projects and the work that we do is amazing, and the impact of it's incredible, and the payoff of the work is great. So um, I think you know we find enough great people that are like motivated by that and come and work with us. And we have sort of built up a great team as a result. Um, there's so many different applications where like the data can have a real impact and we're just sort of scratching the surface. But everything from vision zero, climate change, equity, preservation equity, congestion, uh, all of the sort of new modes of mobility in the city. We haven't, we've never even touched on road operations. Like there, there's a, there's a data challenge that could have a big impact. Things like winter maintenance and um, the maintenance of our streets. Um, but the demand for data and decision making just gets bigger. You know, they, every project in the city, we're kind of people are wanting us to do this like King Street pilot approach, and it's just you can only do it so many times. It's too much energy and effort. Um, so you know, that's where we need to sort of come in and ask where the impact is being made for the projects and prioritize the ones that uncover insights that can drive policy and improvements. Um, so the last piece is, piece is if any of you want to you can come work with us. Um, where we have a bunch of jobs that are going to be posted soon. Probably the most important one is we're posting seven research analyst roles in our team, um, which is sort of the like, uh, not quite entry level, but like, you know, the more, a more junior level team or appropriate for someone coming out of school mostly. Um, but seven roles in the data science team, data operations team, data collection team. So, um, yeah, if you're interested, you, you know where to find me, and the jobs will be getting posted hopefully in the next couple of weeks there. Um, if any of your undergraduate students are also about to post a couple PY jobs, um, a sort of data analyst job that would work, sorry, type of, but work across our, our sort of data science operations and collection team, and also a web developer role for our MOOC team. And then also we're about to post a more senior and experienced role, which is the sort of team lead of that data science practice. So, uh, I think that is it. Happy to answer questions.